On behalf of the Kennedy School of Government, the Institute of Politics, and the Council of Women World Leaders, we'd like to welcome you tonight to this public address. I'm Laura Liswood. I'm the Secretary General of the Council of Women World Leaders. The Council is composed of the sitting current and former heads of state and heads of government women, of which there are 28 in the world today, of which the uh, President is a member. Uh, the Council uh, uh, moves to bring the women together, to allow them to network, to bring visibility to women as leaders, to be role models to young women in leadership. Tonight, I have the great pleasure of introducing the President of Latvia, Vera Vika Freberg. Upon taking her oath on 8th of July, 1999, to become Latvia's new president and first woman president, Dr. Vika Freberg inherited from her pre predecessor a country of great political chaos. There was a prime minister's resignation, the EU and international organi organizations were criticizing Latvia's new language law. There was a looming budget disaster. They were faced with challenges of economic modernization and the ability to attract foreign investment and an economy mired in recession. But the president's background and experience make her well equipped to deal with these many challenges of her country. A linguist and psychologist by training, the president made a name for herself as an academic in Montreal, both at the University of Montreal and at McGill University. President Vika Freyberg was just seven when, fearing possible arrest and deportation, she and her family fled the Soviet invasion in the closing days of World War II. Their ship journey from Latvia was treacherous. Some of those ships taking the same route were torpedoed and sunk. After living in refugee camps in Germany, the family eventually settled in Canada, where the first, the, job of the first job of the president was a bank teller. She later became a respected professor at the university. She is a, has great linguistic skills. She speaks five languages, English, French, German, Latvian, and Spanish. She gives her a great capability to communicate the desires and hopes and dreams of Latvia to the world. The ability to communicate that flawlessly has also made her an indispensable tool for Latvia towards EU and NATO integration. She has an image of being incorruptible and not beholden to any group in Latvia. The president serves as Latvia's number one envoy to the world and is often seen as a bridge between Latvia and the West. She is a powerful symbol for women also in Latvia, in Europe, and in the world for having women taking their rightful role at the highest positions of leadership. We are delighted, so pleased, to welcome a council member, President of Latvia, Vera Vika Freiberger. Thank you, Laura. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here in this setting which reminds us of the ancient Greek Agora with the accessibility to a broad public, the freedom to express one's ideas and above all the possibility of dialogue and exchange. In our dialogue this afternoon, I'd like to start out with a few remarks and reflections about the place of Latvia, a small and recently independent country in Europe and in the global world. It would be a bit like bringing coals to Newcastle to be talking at Harvard about the miracles of modern globalization the changes that we can expect from technology since uh, these hallowed halls have, of course, been, I think, home to many of the ideas that have nurtured the global world of today. I'd like to focus on the interplay between large and small, between centralized and decentralized. 
and about sovereignty or the loss of it or the giving up of it and finally coming back to the citizen, the individual for whom any structures, be they the nat nation state or any structures above it, the citizen who is the be-all and end-all of any society in its civil structures. Latvia was born as an independent nation on the ruins of the Tsarist Empire and was part of a movement in Europe where ethnic groups that had been kept without their own governance for many centuries under rule by systems operating with a different language and often a different set of values where large empires had ruled cutting across ethnic groups, cultures, religions and traditions. The Europe of post-war World War I was a Europe where the aspirations of the German Romantics to regaining the heritage of the past for each separate nation in Europe, the heritage of the Romantics was linked with each national heritage in an effort and a hope to create new nation states that would be more responsive to both the values, the beliefs and the emotional needs of the various new nation states. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, the three Baltic states, were born at the same time and suffered a similar fate of development during the interwar period of occupation first by the Soviet Union after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between Hitler and Stalin, then being invaded by Nazi Germany. In the case of Latvia, having our soil sloughed with innocent blood during the Holocaust, which was carried out on our territory, and then a resumption of the Russian occupation, the Soviet occupation, in 1945. During the next nearly half century, Latvia and its immediate neighbors lived in the totalitarian and centralized system, being one of the 15 republics of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Empire started to collapse, the three Baltic countries were the first to see the opportunity for regaining their independence, and in many ways their striving for independence was an important contributing factor in bringing about the end of that particular empire. Latvia signed the then, if you like, a parliament of the Soviet Republic of Latvia took a vote on the renewal of independence exactly 10 years ago on the 4th of May. And similar votes were taken in Lithuania and in Estonia. Latvia picked up again the constitution that had governed it before as a parliamentary republic with universal suffrage. Women had had the right to vote since 1918, the birth of the Republic. Latvia resumed the parliamentary system that it had had before, but it was faced, of course, with a practical implementation of these new democratic structures in a country that was basically the ruins of a centralized totalitarian state. One of the difficulties was to re-establish an economic independence from an empire which throughout its existence had tried through every possible means to ensure that it would be kept together by lines of interdependence and interconnection in 
industrial, productivity, and the whole economic system. Latvia, for instance, was the site of a strong, I might say a forced, program of industrialization. Many plants of heavy industry were built, workers imported from elsewhere in the Soviet Union by the tens of thousands. And the raw materials for this work frequently shipped thousands of miles uh, across vast territories, and the end products again shipped across vast miles of territory. In that system, in a sense of keeping every part of the empire interconnected and interdependent and subject to central rule from Moscow. The argument, one of the arguments offered by certain forces in Moscow claiming that the three Baltic countries could never be independent was their economic dependence on the Soviet Union, or if you like, that union of states uh, that it was felt they should remain uh, linked to forever and ever. Now, it's a strange thing that in spite of the close links that had been uh, built up, these were not uh, cast in cement and uh, very quickly unraveled in many ways because the whole economic uh, structure of the Soviet Union, of course, collapsed. Its industries uh, were simply not competitive in the global markets, and many of them had to close their doors uh, with, of course, a social cost that was considerable since so many thousands of workers lost their jobs as well as their pensions. The system thus was bankrupt in many ways, and the independent countries, all of them, of the former Union and the former satellite countries, faced the same problem, that is, of rebuilding both their democratic structures practically anew and rebuilding a sound economic basis, uh, this time on ideologically radically different uh, grounds, this time on free market principles of free exchange. And free exchange, of course, not just the restitution of private property as a basic concept of civil law, but also the free exchange uh, across borders according to all the accepted uh, practices and customs of international trade. Very soon uh, it became apparent that the fall of the Iron Curtain, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, could not often by itself be the end of all our problems. In many ways, it was but the beginning. Latvia wanted to return to Europe, a Europe from which it had been forcefully cut off for many decades, but that Europe had, in the intervening decades, become a different one from that of the 20s and the 30s, in which Latvia had been able to successfully compete and stand on its own. The European Union had created a completely different environment, particularly in terms of economic competition. And it became quickly obvious that to survive in modern Europe, the best decision by far would be to join forces and to try and become a candidate member of the European Union. And here we are faced with this rather strange paradox. Here is a country that had just, after long hopes and dreams, managed to cut itself up from a centralized empire, had recovered its independence, had recovered its sovereignty, and here it was rushing into the arms of another union and to some extent standing ready to give up some of its sovereignty to what would become now a higher decision-making power in Brussels as it is for all the other members of that uh, particular, you might say, confederation of states. 
It's certainly a paradoxical situation, but we must remember one cardinal difference, and that is that the European Union was built up on the free decision of its constituent members gradually over a period of years, each new member coming in as an equal partner, each new member joining an acquis communautaire, uh, a body of laws and regulations that had been slowly built up over the years, that had been slowly established and honed through experience, debate, discussion, often passionate disagreement, but through finally compromise and mutual agreement. It is as part of such a body that Latvia has put up its candidature for the European Union. It is our desire to rejoin the community of our continent. It is a desire to become equal partners in a body of equal sovereign states where we will not be just simply spectators to the world moving on without us, where we would be part of the fray, where we would be full participants, where we would have our share of the decision making, where we could have our input into the debates and the issues of the day. And of course we can do that uh, without being members of the Union, but the acquis communautaire that the European Union offers presents a closer integration of the system of laws and of social values that has been built up. And this presents a ready-made model that Latvia stands ready to adapt and to make its own. The process, in fact, has been going on now for the last few years. And our candidature was made official at the Helsinki summer last uh, Helsinki summit uh, last December. Since that time, we have become an official candidate for accession. We have started negotiations on the 31 chapters that constitute the various aspects of the acquis communautaire of Europe, and we are we have moving on the so-called fast track of accession and hope to have completed negotiations by the end of the next year. Uh, so that this being the month of May 2000, we have a very short time left. We hope to be ready for ratification by the member states by January 1st, 2003. The process of ratification, as you may or may not know, uh, will involve each of the European member states. Uh, each will have to make a decision. For many, it's a referendum that will have to be called. Uh, it may take some time, so that it's a matter uh, of several years before we do become actually members. The newly independent state of Latvia, having uh, suffered the consequences of not having sufficient defenses of its own, is also looking towards the NATO alliance as an umbrella of safety and security for its future. We have been told at various times uh, that uh, there is no need uh, for us to become members of NATO. Uh, it might annoy our neighbors to the east and why don't we just uh, remain as we are? I think the argument uh, is about as valid as that saying to France uh, or, or to Germany that they don't need to be members of NATO either, or, or the United States for that matter. Uh, we feel that the presence, the existence of such, such an alliance is precisely the factor that has guaranteed peace and security in a Europe which, after all, had been torn by bloody wars for centuries on end. Think back on the Second World War and all the wars before it. The enmity between France and Germany, that between France and England, stretching back over the centuries, 
one country against another, and on and on with endless bloodshed. The new Europe has put an end to all that, and in many ways is the modern equivalent of what the United States went through after its war of secession. It is a coming together of a body of various uh, sizes of units of governance with common purpose, with common values, and with common goals. In this modern environment, Latvia, a small country, by joining the European Union, will become quite a different place for development and for economic growth. Laura Lissud mentioned some of the economic difficulties that we've been going through uh, in these last few years. One of them has been the necessity to invest large capital into the infrastructures which were either worn down or obsolete or in many cases had to be built up uh, from scratch. That sort of capital obviously was not available uh, within the country. One had to look for it abroad. And this in competition with many another country with its own needs and its own problems. How could a small country like Latvia hope to attract, attract important investors with a size of two and a half million? Uh, and the potential for an inner market, obviously, uh, smaller than that of many a large American city. Joining the European Union puts a completely different complexion on things. Anybody investing in Latvia has now an entry into uh, the European common market. As candidate states, we already have uh, agreements and access uh, that others do not have and certainly the moment that we become full members where our access to all these markets will be totally unlimited. This then to any for instance American investor getting in at the, uh, ground on the ground floor getting in now uh, as the country is poised for this uh, momentous change is an opportune moment uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that this region of the globe offers, certainly a region of Europe which experts agree will be probably one of uh, exceptional growth within the whole continent of Europe. Although there again we may have surprises. Countries like Ireland that have been considered as lagging economically have shown, and by the way, after joining the European Union, have been able to show remarkable spurts in growth and development, and so that any sorts of surprises, and I hope pleasant ones, may be in store for us there as well. I'd like to say a few words about the whole concept of globalization uh, from this framework of a small country giving up, in a sense, part of its sovereignty to uh, a union of nations which will impose on it certain laws and regulations and requirements. The European Union will tell us what size and what shape cucumbers uh, we will be able to put on the market and if we happen to prefer uh, smaller cucumbers that are maybe crooked or, or turning the wrong way, uh, then we'll have to keep them for our own tables or, or, or even we'll have difficulties in selling them uh, on the internal market. Uh, there you may have heard the uh, violent dispute that had lasted for years in, between the north and the south of Europe as to what should be the definition of chocolate. Uh, I guess this is a, a burning issue uh, with which you may not be familiar here in America, but in Europe it was a, a very burning issue because uh, countries such as France and Belgium, which as you know produce uh, arguably uh, the best chocolates in the world, consider that chocolate is the bitter 
brown stuff uh, without any uh, fat added to it or cream if you like uh, whereas uh, in Britain and in Northern Europe they actually like milk chocolate and consider uh, and prefer uh, a substance they call chocolate uh, which has milk uh, or cream uh, included in it and it's only very recently that they could come to an agreement and many people feel that this the, uh, the regulations that the European Union imposes on people to some extent uh, are an interference uh, not just into the freedom and the sovereignty of, at, at the nation state level but that they produce interference into uh, local, regional or ethnic tastes and preferences. So that do not let me leave you with the impression uh, that everything is just smooth uh, and, and calm uh, and without controversy within the heart of Europe, quite the contrary. Uh, every agreement that, uh, that has been come to uh, frequently uh, is a compromise between quite opposing views and many agreements have uh, been created under certain historical conditions where possibly they become obsolete later on and would seriously need to be re-examined. What, uh, what has held it together, I believe, is the common values these countries hold, their common rooting in Western uh, democracy, uh, their uh, common sense of what it means to live in a civil society, to live in an open society, uh, to live in a just society. And here again, these are not uh, concepts that are static and that have been defined once and for all, uh, but quite the contrary. These are evolving concepts. They've been evolving since ancient Greece. We are constantly reinventing and rethinking the meaning of justice, of social justice, of individual justice. And this is as it should be. I think it's the day that we stop and stop evaluating and stop thinking about our basic values that we are going to be into serious trouble. In that sense, the European Union, because of its great diversity, has great potential for future growth and for future creativity. Of course, as you know, the very number of new candidate states will put a strain on this union. It will make it difficult for all to be integrated. But the way I see it, it will be a great challenge and a great opportunity to, co -op, to come up with solutions that had, I hope, not been seen before and that will be better than the ones that we've been living with until now. The rights, the privileges of a citizen in any nation state are, of course, these days curtailed in many ways not just by supranational powers such as the United Nations or the European Union, but also by big business, by international corporations, by global market forces, by financial movements across the world. And in a very large measure, and I do come back to that shibboleth of uh, the uh, modern globalization, and that is the advance of uh, technology. It's very hard to imagine what the world of tomorrow will be like and how it will impact on the nation state and on the society that we live in. With the uh, biological techniques that are already available, we could imagine some place on this planet, a nation of Amazons uh, produced by virgin birth, a nation only of women uh, where uh, sisterhood uh, would reign and, and no men would be allowed. Uh, we can imagine nations where possibly by cloning uh, only men would be allowed and male chauvinists could reign in peace without the presence of women. Uh, the, the possibilities, uh, in fact, uh, are staggering. And I think that in this day and age we have barely begun even to imagine what modern technology can do, what it can achieve. We've barely begun to imagine what the internet will do to change our lives to change democracy the way, for instance, direct participation now becomes possible through the internet 
in a way that was only possible through the cumbersome process of votes and referendums and so on before. So that we stand not just on the threshold of this new century and this new millennium, uh, but truly on a threshold of a world that may be entirely different from the one we know now in a very, very short time indeed. But let us remain firm in the hope that we'll continue to be a world where the individual human being, living in their social milieu, living in the society and state of which they are a citizen, will find a milieu that will give them sustenance for the body, nourishment for the soul, and potential for the growth of their spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. And now we turn to the part of the program which includes the questions. Uh, there are four microphones, uh, two down here and two up there. I see a man with a wing scram up there. Okay, two up there. I'd like to ask that you identify yourself uh, and uh, once again repeat, as is often repeated with the forum, the question should be a question and relatively short. Uh, so we'll start here, please. Hi, my name is Michaela Stein, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School of Government. Um, President Vitti Freiberger, within the past few weeks, rather sharp words were exchanged between you and Russian officials, uh, reflecting the tension between um, Russia and Latvia, as well as um, Estonia and Lithuania. The mo main point of disagreement being the status of the large number of Russian speakers in Latvia. The paradox is that ethnic Russians, according to many polls in Latvia, are strong, if not stronger, proponents of EU membership than Latvians. If, or I should say when, Latvia and the other Baltic states join the European Union, how do you think that this will impact Russians' approach to the region, and in particular, Latvian relations with the Russian Federation? Thank you. As far as Latvia is concerned, it is the Russians living uh, within Latvia uh, that are uh, the people we have to live with above all. Uh, uh, they are our neighbors, uh, friends, co-citizens in many cases, or in other cases non-citizens as the case may be, but they're living within the same geographical space. and. Uh, this population is unusual in many ways since apart from about 10 to 15 percent of them who, whose ancestors were there before the Second World War, they are newcomers who came with the Soviet Empire. And they chose at the moment of independence not to return to where they had come from. Unlike the French in Algeria who had been there five generations but were forced to leave. And unlike the French in Morocco where I used to live as a teenager, and where the Europeans and the Jews left on uh, the independence in 1956. In this situation, we have two sets of problems, and I'm not sure which one interests you most, of the relationship with the Russian-speaking population of, of Latvia within our frontiers, and our relationship with Russia as a, a neighbor. More the latter. The latter. The uh, declaration of uh, Latvian independence uh, 10 years ago was actually accepted and signed by then uh, President Yeltsin. And uh, in a formal sense then, uh, Russia has accepted, uh, albeit somewhat reluctantly in some quarters, the fact that three, uh, three states, uh, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, are now independent and sovereign again. From the pronouncements of some of its officials, one gets the impression that they tend to forget it at times. And uh, that they, some of them haven't quite noticed uh, that time has passed on and that we are living now in a different world. Um, on a diplomatic uh, plane, our relations at the moment 
uh, are somewhat cool uh, and somewhat distant, but there have been no formal uh, declarations of enmity. Uh, at least uh, so far, uh, they have been uh, remarks that have been made on various separate topics. Our diplomatic relations remain officially open and quite normal. Madam President, my name is Ignacio Estella. I'm an MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for your address. Uh, I like your reference to chocolate. It does say a lot about Europe that uh, after years we only fight about chocolate and we agree about democracy. But um, my question to you today is when you face and address your people and, and uh, describe to them the prospects of joining the European Union, do you do it in terms of a dream that, that will be joining back a continent that you were separated from, or is it a bottom line? Because it's a hard road ahead, and competitiveness and the shocks and agriculture and industry will suffer. Um, so what, how do you approach and how do you make them believe in it? Well, it's, it's a hard world, period. And uh, we face competitiveness at any rate. Uh, standing as a small nation with two and a half inhabitants as a market, our chances of survival are much smaller than, as I say, becoming part of the 100 million or so uh, that are the market uh, and the forum of exchange uh, of the European Union. Uh, we have to think of the fact that within that space, within that common space, we can expect uh, a more intensive flow of investments into Latvia, which, by the way, at the moment, our uh, the countries that have invested apart from the United States are European, Western European and Northern European countries. Uh, we fully expect that in the years to come this will continue and accelerate. And uh, the adjustments that have to be done, for instance the factories that are outdated and that will not be able to compete either in Singapore uh, or in Sydney or in, in Moscow or in Brussels, uh, they simply have to be uh, rethought, redesigned, uh, reinvented. Uh, some of the areas in which uh, Latvia has been productive will probably have to be abandoned. Uh, others will have to be restructured, retooled. We have to find new niches. We have to invest into education and science and research and development. Uh, we have to develop the areas of information technology and, and knowledge intensive uh, industries. Uh, all this we'd have to do anyway. And we might as well do it with the support of the FAR and the SAPARD and the other programs that Europe has to offer. I can't see. It. Is there someone up there on that mic? Please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Weissman. Imagine that uh, President Clinton and leaders of Congress were in the audience tonight as the leader of a nation which was formerly uh, part of the USSR and is presently a neighbor of Russia. What would you say to President Clinton and leaders of Congress concerning present debates in the United States to build a missile defense system and possibly to modify the anti-ballistic missile treaty? Well, frankly, that's a, a question on which Latvia, as you may imagine, is, is not a player, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but a spectator. <laughs> and uh, as, uh, you might say, innocent bystanders or, or the people who would be obviously caught in the crossfire of any sort of exchange of missiles in the world, uh, our fervent hope is that there would be uh, by one means or another an overall reduction in such armaments, and I think we're not alone. Uh, in that uh, in that conviction and in that opinion. Uh, my name is Felicity Spector. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, I just want to ask you about the way you handle being a small country trying to enter the European Union. I know that Britain, a lot of British people were worried that um, there would be a loss of identity and sovereignty for Britain through joining forces with the rest of Europe. Um, how do you aim to preserve the Latvian identity within a very much larger European Union? And what would be your, your negotiating style when, when faced with having to make compromises? Do you think you would have to be more tough than the larger countries, or that you'll have to give way to the kind of un unanimous or uh, overarching opinion? Well, as for preserving our identity, we've had lots of practice, <laughs> centuries of it. <laughs> And 
for negotiating. Uh, this is the, the beautiful thing about the European Union, is that negotiations are, I do feel, strict and fair. Uh, there are the Copenhagen criteria uh, that the country has to answer to. Uh, there are various uh, uh, systems and regulations uh, that one has to fulfill. And uh, it's really uh, not a matter of whether uh, we accept uh, any of this or not, but how and how soon. And the negotiations really focus on uh, the give and take in concrete matters, such as just recently uh, we had uh, put some protective measures on, on pork uh, in Latvia. Uh, Europe already responded by saying that they would, they would block our milk products. Uh, so we had to do away with the subsidies uh, to pork, uh, or rather to give subsidies rather than, than to have, uh, sorry, import duties as, as had been uh, the case. Uh, this sort of negotiation uh, has been going on in Europe constantly. We, we have no illusions about being freed from it. And obviously the impact uh, of the decisions in many cases will be more painful for us uh, than it might be for a larger country. Uh, but then again, uh, I think in some aspects it will be easier for us to adjust, because unlike Britain, which has been able to stand as an island uh, and rely on its, on its empire to support it, as I say, we have had lots of practice in adjusting. Hi, my name is Nalini Jans, and I'm asking two questions on behalf of Chris Ralt. Uh, the great duchy, uh, Duchy of Gorland, which is largely in Latvia, used to be all powerful and even reached to Africa. What is left of it in ideas or in brick and mortar? And is any use made for tourism or for the movie industry? Well, the great Duchy of Gorland, um, for one thing, had a beautiful flag. <laughs> and that flag, uh, I think, in many ways, uh, should be revived. A red lobster on a, on a black uh, on the black ground. Uh, it was uh, they had a colony um, on the coast of Africa, and also Tobago, the island of Tobago, uh, was a was a colony uh, of the Duchy of Courland. The Duke Jacob uh, was uh, ruling at the time. Uh, they have as a a relic of those times, a Bay of Courland there, and occasional groups of tourists of Latvian origin uh, going over uh, uh, about once a year, uh, having a lot of fun. Uh, and I think that, uh, of course, with the Latvian winters, it would be wonderful if we could all vacation in our former colony, if only it weren't so far away. Madam President, thank you for your remarks. I'm Ruby Boy, a participant in the Leadership Education Program. My request is, would you kindly respond to the potential, the impact, and the plans for women-led and owned businesses in your country? Uh, sorry, could you repeat this? Uh, you asked for the impact, the... The impact, the potential, and the plans for women-led businesses in your country. Well, the women in my country, for some reason, have become very energized uh, within the last year. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and the business women in particular uh, have uh, sort of regained confidence uh, in their powers uh, and in their abilities. Uh, when um, I led uh, the Latvian delegation to the uh, Women and Democracy Conference in Reykjavik uh, uh, last October, uh, we had nearly 40 members in the delegation. Many of them were uh, business women. One was a bank president. Others were high executives. Uh, some were uh, founders and heads of small or medium businesses. Uh, so that there is a really a thriving uh, community uh, of uh, women, very recent, uh, some of them uh, are just in the process of founding their enterprises and the funds that were, uh, by the way, uh, allotted to our region uh, following as a follow-up to the Reykjavik conference uh, will allow small loans to be made uh, to women starting uh, small businesses. And this is a wonderful initiative which will help uh, give them the initial push, uh, help them to get uh, low-cost loans, uh, loans as opposed to the loans in our banks which often have high interest rates uh, attached to them, especially uh, for starting small businesses. 
And I am very hopeful and very optimistic uh, about the role that uh, women uh, business leaders will play uh, in the general improvement of our economy. Uh, Laura Lissud mentioned the uh, economic difficulties we had. This was largely influenced by the Russian crisis. Many manufacturers in Latvia uh, found themselves having shipped goods to Russia as they had before and not being able to receive payment in return. And orders, of course, stopping because of inability of payment on the part of their clients. Uh, as they, these businesses have reoriented uh, their markets uh, toward Western Europe and other parts of the world, and this is globalization where that comes in, uh, I think that we are looking forward uh, to a new growth in our economy. Our growth had been nearly 8% before the Russian crisis. It went into the minus. This year we are back to zero. Uh, we are on an upward swing. I think we are going to have a growth of 2 to 4% within the coming calendar year. So that things look very hopeful. And so if you're interested in women doing business, do come to Latvia and collaborate with them. Uh, hello, uh, Madam President. My name is Melissa, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Latvia from 1997 to 1999. Um, I taught in the Yekapils region, actually. Uh, my question actually involves around education, of course. Um, I'm very happy to hear about the upward swing in businesses. My question involves um, education and investors. The wages in Latvia for teachers are approximately $120 a month, whereas most people work, I believe, an average in 1998 about $200, $240 a month. That includes Riga, of course. Um, my question is, the wages in the schools are, are really terrible. Um, the situation, most women who pretty much teach in the schools, they're leaving the schools to start their own businesses, but it's leaving a huge gap in education there. The classrooms are getting huge. Students are not able to, uh, I mean, 40 kids per class. My question is about attracting investors. If the students aren't given an adequate education because people are more concerned about putting monies into uh, attracting investors, what will happen for the state of people in Latvia when they don't have the education enough to work in these businesses that you're trying to attract? What you're describing is the vicious circle that sets in uh, once there's an economic recession. Uh, because of the Russian crisis and the economic recession, the income of the state, uh, the state budget, was, uh, was reduced considerably. And since teachers are paid on the state budget, it meant uh, that either you paid or increased the salaries of teachers uh, at the same rate as before, or if you wanted to increase them, then you had to take it away from the field of health or, or infrastructure or other areas. Uh, in order to attract business, uh, you have to show that you have a stable currency. We do have that. We've had it since the very beginning. Uh, you have to show stable macroeconomic indicators. We do have that, so that is a plus. But you also need uh, to show a reasonably balanced budget. And this is where the presence of a deficit, we had been warned uh, by the International Monetary Fund and other institutions that Latvia could not afford uh, a deficit budget. Now, many countries, many Western countries have large deficits, and this is considered perfectly acceptable because they are mature economic systems and, uh, and there is confidence in their future. But in a, in a newly developing uh, economic system, such as ours, of course, the confidence isn't there as yet, so that heavy pressure was put on our government to balance the budget or to come near it. And when you do that, that means you cut expenditures, and the, for instance, our, the previous government, which just fell recently, one of the reasons it fell was because it had promised education as a priority, and then because of the attempt to balance the budget, wasn't able to raise the salaries of teachers sufficiently uh, to do the necessary job. There was a small increase uh, that was reluctantly agreed to, but it's obviously not uh, sufficient to the needs. 
uh, in that sense, uh, we, we're entering in what the French call a magic circle, if you have a vicious circle, uh, one thing leading to another, uh, somehow we have to cut through this, the Gordian knot and, and resolve the difficulty, and I think it's going to be a gradual process, both things happening at once, gradual increases in the salaries of teachers, they can't be substantial without ruining the state budget, uh, gradual increases in the general welfare, therefore improving uh, the income of the state through income taxes and other excise and so on. Uh, and finally, of course, I think what is necessary in a, in a population is an understanding of the importance of education, of a full acceptance that it is a priority, not just at the time of elections, but, but generally. Uh, and, and this is a job that we still have to work on. My name is Jaak Johansson. I'm a local Estonian. Thank you for being here. You're a terrific speaker. I was delighted to see that you were able to visit my hometown of Pultsam, Estonia, and plant that tree in Friendship Park. Thank you for that. Laying aside the sardine wars between Estonia and Latvia, how do you see uh, for closer cooperation in the field of economics between the three Baltic states? And if that's too general, maybe you can address just the particular field of energy. Exactly. There's a debate going on this very moment. I had a phone call from Latvia. Uh, saying that the, the official debate had started. And uh, uh, this is uh, a project, I think, of, uh, of capital importance to both our countries. First of all, uh, the, the energy system in Latvia uh, has not been privatized as yet, so this is an important step. Uh, this is a huge, uh, Latvian Ergo is a huge company making a substantial profit. It's the biggest taxpayer uh, into the coffers of the state. Uh, so that it's at the moment uh, a very profitable thing. And by the way, politically, many people are not ready to see it privatized. They say, what's going to happen if it's, it comes into private hands? Uh, what will happen to the re revenue that uh, the state derives from it now? But it's obvious that in terms of, of markets and of competitivity, uh, the energy system of Latvia and of, uh, of Estonia are naturals to be coupled together. Latvia has hydroelectric power which produces uh, uh, very high rates of, of energy when the river Daugava is flowing well, when there are sufficient rains, uh, when the snows have melted and so on, uh, whereas, uh, and has a surplus at those times, uh, and possibly a shortage when the weather runs dry. Whereas uh, in Estonia, you have fuel-induced uh, energy, uh, fuel-produced energy, and this would allow the two being pooled together, would equalize uh, the resources, would equalize uh, the supply, uh, allow uh, for, for uh, the, uh, this combined energy company to be competitive in the region, would allow it to export, actually, power uh, to, uh, to neighboring countries where uh, economic development is such that they often need uh, to be importers of power. Thank you. My name is Nalini Johnson again, and I am a student of the Program of Economics and the Environment here. I do have another question from Chris, but I will ask my own right now. Um, in terms of the environmental impacts uh, of all of these activities that are going on, in terms of the initiatives, the economic initiatives that you're uh, conducting with hydropower and so forth, um, do you feel that the fact that Latvia might be able to join the European Union, will that benefit? Will that, is that part of the negotiation that you're uh, conducting with the European uh, Union? Uh, how will it help uh, minimize these impacts, and is that being addressed? The environmental question is, is one of the more difficult ones. Uh, within the Union as a whole, and certainly for candidate countries. Uh, it and agriculture are the two, I think, most difficult chapters. The European standards for the environment are extremely high, mm -hmm. so that in terms of protection of the environment, uh, they are very good uh, for the Earth, uh, but they are very onerous uh, on each country uh, that has to live up to them. Uh, they, indeed, many of these regulations are extremely costly, and it's, it's quite evident that the, uh, all these post-Soviet countries uh, that are now uh, standing there as candidate states will have great difficulties uh, with an immediate future uh, to be able to introduce uh, environmental protection standards uh, at exactly the same level and at all at the same time. And uh, what has happened with, with negotiations so far in other countries is that uh, periods of transition are allowed, and these, this is where tough negotiation comes in. 
in terms of uh, just uh, what is excluded and for how long is something that will have to be negotiated very hard. Yes, my name is Vester Slench. I'm a student of engineering management at MIT. The question that I have for you is, you mentioned competition in the past. Um, what particular industries or areas do you target in terms of offering competitive advantages within Latvia with regards to the rest of Europe? And what would you think those competitive advantages would be? Well, right at the moment, uh, Latvia, of course, offers the advantage of a labor force. We heard the, the figures about the average income. Uh, obviously, a cheap labor force uh, is an inducement. Uh, uh, you don't have to go across the globe uh, for a company operating, say, in Europe. Uh, you can find uh, uh, educated, uh, in many cases experienced and uh, disciplined and well-trained people ready to work in industry or to recycle, as the French say, you know, to be retrained uh, from uh, their previous types of occupations. So that the, the human resources, I think, are inducement. And then the government is, of course, uh, offering various tax advantages, uh, free, uh, free uh, duty zones and uh, these sort of things, uh, tax, uh, uh, tax havens or holidays over, over the next uh, certain period of years, uh, and various arrangements of that sort. Uh, the, uh, the competitiveness is, uh, is one also between neighboring countries. Why come to Latvia rather than uh, Estonia or Lithuania in many cases? Well, Latvia is very conveniently located between the other two, so that's our advantage. <laughs> Uh, by going there, you can reach the other two at, in the shortest possible time. Uh, we have uh, three large seaports that never freeze over, uh, that are well equipped for, for international transport, so that uh, these are the sorts of inducements, of course, that, uh, that we have to make known. It's very, very often it's a case of letting people know that you are there. This is what I'm trying to do today, for instance, <laughs> reminding people that we are there and ready and waiting. I'm Vilnius Bersens. I'm um, chairman of American Latvian Association in Boston. Uh, my question is actually going back to European Union and ethnic identity, which was touched previously, and probably a little deeper, if possible. It uh, seems like um, that all of the uh, questions or all r rules, regulations, in coming from European Union uh, will be so strict that they uh, may uh, have difficulty or that we have difficulty for ethnic identity because there are also indications that um, European Union would prefer that there is a second official language in Latvian, not only Latvian but also Russian. And is it possible that European Union will, will become socialistic union with dictate everyone, you know, what they should do, what they should say, what language could be used? Well, as for it becoming a dictatorship, that will be up to the citizens in the European Parliament uh, to see that this does not happen. And I rather suspect that it will not. Uh, f with respect to the language law, Laura mentioned in her introduction that uh, immediately uh, upon uh, taking office, I was faced with a language law uh, that had suffered criticism from the European Union but had it been adopted by two-thirds of our parliament. And here I had the choice, either to comply with the wishes of the European Union or what some feared antagonized the parliament, which had just elected me days before, uh, by going against uh, a decision that they had just taken and sending back to them a law which they had just voted. Well, I sent back the law, and the law was redrafted. But I must point out, that even the objections that we had at that time from the European Union never raised the question of objecting to Latvia's right of continuity with the Republic of 1918, of Latvia's right of having one official language which is Latvian, in spite of the changed circumstances and the changes induced by the Soviet occupation. This is a very important victory, a political victory for Latvia to have achieved that. And in my contacts uh, with officials from all the member countries of the European Union, I have been assured 
and by High Commissioner Max van der Stoel. Mr. van der Stoel has also assured me that there was no question of doubting the validity or the legality of our situation, which makes Latvian the one and only official language of the country. This is a gain for us, and it is just a matter of then taking care of the rights of minorities, of defining the difference between a public and a private sphere. In the private sphere, of course, Russian or any other language can be used freely, as it is in the rest of the European Union. Various members of the European Union have different solutions to the language problem. This is one area where the Union does not enforce, as it does for cucumbers, a uniform size and shape, but it allows for the historical heritage and the, and the legal traditions of each nation to be respected. Thank God for that, and this is what, what has allowed us uh, to have no fears uh, in that regard, in spite uh, of the pressure from Russia. And this is where, for instance, somebody mentioned about the remarks coming from Russia. At the same time as I, as president, received uh, the letters of congratulations on our newly drafted and newly adapted law, language law, which happened last December, complying in every way to international standards, to international uh, requirements for the protection of minority rights. This is the time when Russia chose uh, to object and to say that the inadequacy of our language law uh, should make it impossible for us to be accepted as member sh states. So I do think that there's a, a sort of uh, uh, difficulty in following events uh, on, uh, on the part of some officials in, in Russia. They're just simply not in step with what is happening uh, in the rest of Europe. Hello, my name is Ingrid Admans, and I'm a first-generation Latvian uh, that has grown up here in America. I am a structural engineer working in construction, and uh, this is not exactly a common field for women yet. And uh, as being the first president, woman president of Latvia, I was wondering if this was an easy transition for the other, I guess, uh, parliament and other government people. Uh, have there been any difficulties or adjustments to this, or perhaps even advantages to being a woman in your role? Well, it was a definite advantage. Uh, it attracted a lot of media attention. And for a small country, uh, that's no small consideration. It, it allows one to express one's views, to present uh, the position of my country on non-controversial issues, uh, so that the media attraction of, of having a novelty uh, as a woman president, I think, has been all to Latvia's advantage. As far as being accepted, you mean in terms of my, my colleagues, uh, the people I have to work with in government, um, uh, I must say that uh, on immediately after uh, my election, the first uh, official uh, courtesy call paid on me uh, was by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who had been a candidate against me in the last runoff. He came with a bouquet of flowers and, and in a very gentlemanly way, uh, conceded defeat and, and wished me luck. Uh, the next person to come with a bouquet of flower, uh, flowers was uh, the Minister for Defence. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, defence and, and, and various things. And at the end of our conversation, uh, he said, uh, Madam President, is there a president-elect at the time? Is the, if I may ask a personal question? I said, please do. Uh, he said, immediately after uh, the announcement of your election at, at midnight last night, uh, a journalist asked you, how do you feel uh, about being the head of the armed forces? And I said, I feel fine. <laughs> And the Minister for Defence, uh, the next day, uh, on this courtesy call, said, are you really serious about it? Do you really mean it? And I had to tell him again, I feel just fine. We will take two more questions. One up there, please. Hello. My name is Heidi Glunz. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is a little bit of a follow-up. I spent two years teaching in Poland and visited your country at the time. And I was wondering, um, we've had women as presidents and prime ministers in Poland and Lithuania and in Latvia, and we're impatiently waiting um, that, that development here in the United States. And I was wondering if you felt that there were certain factors that contributed to 
to the opportunity to become uh, women leaders in your countries due to the fact that you're emerging democracies or if it's more coincidental? It's very hard to judge, you know, in all fairness. I'm not sure that I can, I can give you a precise answer to that. I suspect it's a, it's a question that will have to be evaluated by historians uh, when we have uh, the advantage of the perspective of the passage of time and then can return uh, and analyze with some objectivity uh, what were the conditions and that might have been conducive in one way or the other. I just might mention uh, in terms of the social climate that just a few years ago when uh, President Ullman, as my predecessor, uh, was running for re-election for his second term, because he served two of them, uh, uh, another candidate running against him uh, was a lady, Dr. Kratos. And at the time, uh, the, the, uh, the sort of climate of public opinion uh, in the country did tend to treat this as a bit of a joke. Uh, I mean, uh, she was a serious candidate and, and certainly had a, a strong party at the time, now disappeared, but at the time a strong party behind her. Uh, and in, in some ways the whole thing certainly was uh, very serious indeed. Uh, but the sort of remarks that people dropped off casually or in the press uh, tended to be of the, of the sort that, well, you know, it's a bit of a joke, you know, a woman actually daring to run for president. Uh, I had a great advantage uh, over her in that regard, is that I didn't have an election campaign. And um, see, we have a parliamentary system uh, where uh, the president is elected by the parliament. Uh, it's, it's, it's very useful to the country, it saves a lot of money. Think of the, the millions spent on, on election campaigns uh, in your country here. Uh, and in that sense, because there was no campaign, I suppose any, any kind of uh, resistance or, or negative feelings in many ways um, were not touched upon. And I think that possibly in that brief period of years, the country is evolving so fast and, and becoming modern uh, so fast that in some ways it's, it's run ahead of itself and certainly it's run ahead of maybe more mature democracies. I like to think that it is so and that it is my election is, uh, is a sign and symptom of the, of the democratic maturity of people in Latvia. One last question, please. Yes, my name is John Trupp. I'm interested in NATO issues. I'd like to ask Madam President how she expects uh, the accession of Latvia to NATO will strengthen the alliance. It will strengthen it to the same extent as, as any member does in an alliance, and that is by adding uh, to uh, the whole uh, some contribution uh, commensurate to the size and resources of the country, but any alliance, and certainly this is the case with NATO, any alliance is always greater than the sum of its parts, and uh, I feel that in uh, we have in NATO already a shining example of how uh, countries varying greatly in size can make a contribution. It is therefore as contributors uh, proportionate to our size and resources to the overall strength of the alliance that we see ourselves as candidate states, as states whose inclusion in the alliance will uh, strengthen the alliance by extending its frontiers on the eastern shores of the Baltic, will help to ensure and perpetuate the peace and stability that has been reigning in this northeastern part of Europe in sharp contrast to the southeastern part of Europe, which has suffered grievous troubles uh, in that regard, and as contributors to various international peacekeeping missions, which we already have been doing. Uh, throughout the, the past years, which we're continuing to do now. We contribute to the peacekeeping effort in Bosnia. Uh, we send already uh, members of our armed forces to the peacekeeping effort in Kosovo. And Latvia stands ready to make its contribution along with other members of the alliance. Uh, we plan on spending 2% uh, 
of our gross national product on defence uh, by the year 2003. Uh, this will be more than Iceland has been spending on its defence, uh, and it has been, it's a very small country, even smaller than ours, and it has been, I believe, a valued member of the Alliance through all these years. We hope to become one in the future. of something that one of the other prime ministers, uh, the Polish prime minister, Hannes Sahatka, said, when the problems of a country get too tough, they turn to a woman to solve them. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to the Institute of Politics. I would like to thank very much Bill White, the director of the Institute of Politics Forum, and his capable staff for arranging uh, this event this evening. I'd like to thank Molly Dietz and Nicole O'Reilly, the staff of the council, and thank you all for joining us here tonight. Good night. Good night.